What's up? It's Rowan here from Art of Smart Education with another weekly HSC Economic Stats Update. This video, in a couple of minutes, is where I'm going to summarize all the main news from around the domestic and global economy that you need to know for the HSC Economics course. I'm going to share with you how you can use it in your analysis for your essays. So let's jump right in and start looking at the headlines for this week. The first one is that the monthly CPI was released, and that has risen from 3.6% in April to 4% over the 12 months in May 2024. So unfortunately, inflation is going the wrong way. It's up. Now, note uh, a couple of areas it's up are in housing, uh, food and non-alcoholic beverages, transport and alcohol. Now, wh why this is interesting is on a couple of levels. The first is that you know the federal budget has copped a bit of flack for potentially being inflationary in pressure. It's a mildly expansionary deficit budget. And you know, with the stage three tax cuts coming through, you know, in terms of the, the changes to them, right, um, and these tax cuts coming through in July, right, that may create more inflationary pressure on top of what is already uh, growing inflation, right, from three point six to four percent. So, where this can be really useful for you to talk about in terms of evaluating fiscal policy is really in terms of the macroeconomic policy mix and whether or not the budget is actually going to overheat the economy and they haven't quite got the balance right in trying to deal with cost of living while not creating inflationary pressure. Now, in saying that, note that housing was one of the areas in May that really was driving costs. And the budget does have a number of housing initiatives that are designed to try to take a little bit of steam out of that marketing, including a number of rent assistance packages and funding to increase housing for uh, you know, homelessness and uh, you know, low socioeconomic um, so you could argue that some of the measures, though, are targeted in taking the sting out of some of these areas that are driving some inflationary pressure. Now, no, the ABS does highlight, though, that there was some one-off volatile price changes in these figures, okay? You know, automotive fuel, fruits and vegetables, holiday travel, if you exclude those, the headline CPI, which, you know, is the thing that generally, um, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, like... Uh, including all of these one-offs, right? If you get an underlying, right, you can see that the underlying went from 4.1 in April to 4% in May. So the, you know, the, the picture is actually a little complex, right? Um, because we've got some of these moving parts happening. Now, note um, one of the things that we can sort of consider here, okay, is that um, you know, either way, it's a bit of a nasty surprise, and it does place more pressure on the RBA. So you can also utilize this to evaluate and analyze RBA policy and whether or not it's being successful in driving inflation down. Now, why is that relevant? Well, I think one of the key things that we can see here is that underlying inflation is arguably still intolerably high. You know, it's still at 4%, right? Even if it's down from 4.1 to 4, right, in terms of underlying um, the challenge is, right, is that Australia is now the only G10 country where underlying inflation has increased since December. So you can see here all of the other countries, right, uh, in terms of Switzerland, New Zealand, US, Eurozone, Canada, etc. And ours is going the wrong way. Now, note, in last week's video, one of the things that I looked at was the fact that um, a lot of other countries, you know, have started, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, Canada, right, the Eurozone, even New Zealand, they've started a, an, an interest rate easing cycle now, right? So they're able to start easing their interest rates because they've got inflation under control. Now, a lot of these countries went harder, faster with cash rate increases. So they went much faster and increased it, you know, more quickly to a higher rate than Australia. And so the question is, has Australia got it wrong and has the RBA got it wrong? Should they have gone harder earlier, even more so than they have, to get it under control? Because they always said the risk was that, you know, it would start getting too sticky and they wouldn't be able to shift it. And that's exactly what we might be seeing here right now, which is a real concern. So you can certainly use the global context and the global monetary policy settings and outcomes to evaluate the effectiveness of Australian monetary policy in your essays, right? Now, it wouldn't be a huge component, but it would be something that you could mention as part of, well, look, you know, globally now, our inflation is going the wrong way relative to the globe. You know, their cash rate positions were stronger, faster than Australia, and that brings into question, right, whether or not, you know, uh, the RBA is doing the right, you know, has had the right approach. Now, of course, macro policy mix, you can then bring in fiscal policy and whether or not the upcoming, you know, 24, 25 budget um, being mildly expansionary is also going to exacerbate this. Now, note, um, you know, there will be, uh, you know, a, a bunch of inflation data coming, okay, um, you know, in uh, June, like, you know, sorry, for June in late July, and that will also occur just before the RBA's next meeting in August. So it will be interesting to see where they land. 
Now, the final thing, the final sort of bit of news here is, and this goes to conflict in objectives, right? The RBA has said that to really get inflation down, they're going to need to see unemployment go upwards, okay? Um, which is a conflict. The budget in their own forecasts for the 24-25 budget has also highlighted they're expecting unemployment to go up. And that really does highlight that conflict uh, between getting inflation down. Now, note, um, you know, unemployment going up does tend to you know, reduce wage growth because there's more spare capacity in the economy. It also tends to worsen income inequality. So when you're talking about conflicts here, you don't just have to talk about in your essay inflation versus unemployment because there's second order effects of increasing unemployment that you can also very, very briefly mention. So what we're seeing here is that the jobs market is starting to really soften, okay? And this is what we're looking at here is like a, a leading indicator. Um, the unemployment figure in terms of the percentage of unemployment is what's called a lagging indicator, okay? You only find out about that a little bit later. It takes a bit more time. And so basically, you know, new ABS data shows that job vacancies have dropped for the quarter in May, okay? And in fact, you can see now that they've fallen overall 17.7% over the last 12 months. So in other words, employers are putting less and less new jobs out there. And what that shows, therefore, is we're seeing a softening unemployment market. Now, it's early days yet, okay? Um, but as, you know, capital economics... Uh, you know, chief economist highlights, you know, the figures suggest the job market is souring. We're going to start seeing that unemployment rate tick up as per both the RBA forecast and uh, the federal government's forecast in their budget. And this goes to your analysis around conflict of objectives in your essays when you're looking at limitations of policy. So there we have it, the main three news items for today. If you need any additional support for HSC Economics in the run-in for your HSC trials, remember, I'm running an online class every Wednesday. We're doing deep dives on the key content you need, stat updates, practice short answer questions, multis, and essays to make you all ready for those exams. Only a couple of spots left, um, so uh, you know, don't miss out. Uh, just hit reply to the email if you're looking for some extra support. Otherwise, have an amazing week.